Like, I mean, I remember going to deliver to like executives at Universal and like having to go like back into the lot to bungalows, like wait, like get a little thing, put it on my motorcycle. And they're like, okay, here's the map. Like, and I'm back in like where the trams would go and stuff. You know what I mean? Like on the Universal Studios tour. And I'm like riding my motorcycle back, 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 back to some bungalow where they're making whatever is the next great movie. And you walk in and it's like catering laid out, like the whole nine of these people walking around and like they're better than everybody because they are. At that, they're being told that all day. Sure. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And I'm going to ask these guys, because we were talking about it, and I, I didn't really get to think of another question. It's an easy one. I'm not really much of a TV guy anymore. I don't really watch it. But if you guys, what would you say your favorite TV show is? Like, doesn't you have to be, doesn't you have to hold the test of time? Just when you think of it, like, what's my favorite TV? Oh, I, oh, there you go. That one really was really awesome for me. Like, of all, of all times? Sure, yeah. Favorite TV show? The one that, I, can, I know mine right off the bat is always going to be Battlestar Galactica, the remake. Yeah, yeah, okay, so we're talking about, oh, the, the, the remake one. The remake, right? so, yeah. so we're, okay, so we're not talking about, well... I mean, are we talking about things that are on like premium channels and stuff too? Because I would okay, then I would have to say the wire. Okay, I gotta say, I gotta say the wire. Like, okay. you I've stuck with it? Oh, the whole way. No, okay. no show has ever held my attention like that. I've never seen or, it. Or or get rough. Or Vikings, or oh, Vikings. Yeah, one or the other. Yeah, those are those would be my two for sure. I watched a little bit of Vikings, and that was when I was on my way. That's when I was like leaving the world of TV. I tried one more time with the Vi with with the Vikings, and I was just like, ah, I can't, I can't do another one of these things. It's so good. I've heard. So good. I've heard. So good. Yeah. What, what about, about you, Father? Oh man, this is one of those ones where I'm gonna say something, and then like in three hours, we'll be like, no, I totally forgot <laughs> the show. That's um, me every time. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't say it was my favorite, but it's just one of those ones where I just remember being so riveted by it. There's two of them. They're both really, I mean, like Breaking Bad was really good. I mean, yep. um, but Deadwood was one that like my wife and I really liked Deadwood. That Deadwood was really good. I've never watched it, but you are my mother said the same thing. She was yeah. like, it's incredible. It's, it's incredible. incredible. I mean, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. It, it's I'll tough to because it. Deadwood was like, like, I don't know about you, but you know that feeling you got when you watch the games in New York? Mm -hmm. That kind of like, Ooh. I'm glad I didn't live <laughs> then. I'm glad I'm alive now. I'm kind of don't like the way I feel after watching that. Mm -hmm. I don't ever want to watch it again because it was so gritty and real, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was that feeling like every episode. So interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I got I got to check it out. That will single handedly lead me to stop watching a show. Like, I don't like that, that feeling. feeling. I'm just not that guy. I there. It doesn't mean the show is bad. I'm just not that guy. I 90% of the time, if I watch TV, it's like literally cartoons all of the old dc yeah, see that's the other thing too is i was gonna like bust out like man like robotech i mean that was my first time mm, being okay. like in, enthralled in a whole kind of like storyline you know arc all that stuff so like i mean if we're going there i'll say like shoot robotech you know but um, yeah that was that was a pretty i mean that was a pretty big deal for me i remember that was that's probably the first it's like my intro to drama, you know? Yeah. Although, I don't know, Chips. I was a big Chips guy. Oh, chips. Yeah. <laughs> Frank Poncharello. Yeah. Poncha John. Yeah. Poncha John, man. Yeah. Oh, there was, I mean, the 80s had all those kind of like 
you had chips and Miami Vice and the A Team yeah. and A Team uh, Air Airwolf. Yeah, Airwolf. And uh, oh yeah, those are. Yeah. Oh, uh, Knight Rider. Knight Rider. Oh man, Michael Knight. Magnum Magnum PI. We're oh. this is where we're we're dating ourselves here. <laughs> no, so okay, legitimately, you guys remember those shows fondly? Like, were they good? Oh yeah. Okay. Cool. Oh yeah. Well, I can't it's, get, like a it's vibe. not even about them being good. They were the only things on. Yeah. So it's like you're either watching that. It was they were TV. Like you're either watching that or you're not watching it. <laughs> the, the other stuff that's around those shows is so bad. So bad. Like you can go on YouTube. I I had seen one recently when it was like maybe it was like 80, maybe it was 80, 80 something. But it was like the intro of all of the shows from like CBS in like 83. Like their lineup in 83, it was like the opening scene, the opening credits. Nobody had ever heard, like shows would go on the air and get canceled after like a season. Constantly, constantly. And so it's just like, those were the ones that stuck for, I don't, I, some of I'm them talking, only stuck three, four, five, six seasons, you know? Are you talking about like, like canned laughter sitcoms that get canceled? or No, are, but even, even kind of the more like nighttime more drama e type of situations but there weren't a ton of those on tv at that time you know like a, a show like night rider like that was so beyond anything that was going on at the time the, the car and the, the little thing going on oh yeah man but they're all episodic is the thing so in that way they're like they're like early comic books where they don't really have it really wasn't until Serious. Like cereal. Yeah, they're yeah, they're cereals. It wasn't until the Sopranos, I think, that you had TV shows that were like really had these long, 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 long arcs. You know? Otherwise, I mean the best that you get is like a law and order, right? Where you have oh, the recurring characters. Such a good show though. I I, I love Definitely. Law and Order. Definitely. I mean, it's up there. I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention that like Bat Batman, the animated series was let's let's oh. like without a doubt it's like one of the greatest shows of all time mm-hmm. and hbo max i mooch off my sister and they have all of those old dc shows all of those old dc cartoons so that's that's literally the only reason why i ever get on hbo max is to watch like the old bruce tim stuff there it was it was because of that animated series that harley quinn became mm-hmm. a popular character Paul Dini and Bruce. Definitely off of that. Yeah. And yeah. the best costume, by the way. Her new costume is whack. I just, oh, the shorts that, and everything? No, no, no. Better the, as the just the jester outfit. Stay with the jester. That's the way to that's go. The yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So super awesome. And anyway, I the last thing I want to say about this whole thing is I could not watch Breaking Bad. I like um well, yeah. It was that season with the Gus, is that his name? The restaurant owner that they got involved with i think like something like the beginning of a new season a whole bunch of problems started i was like i just can't do this anymore and i was like turned it off and never turned it back on i was just like i just i don't like any of these characters and i feel cruddy every time i watch it and i'm just i'm just not gonna watch it and i didn't grimy yeah it's grimy without a doubt it's grimy so but good drama often is grimy hey I'm not good drama. I'm not often is yeah. I mean, I can still handle Battlestar Galactica because there's something very endearing in its cheesiness and it's corny. The new, the new or the old? The new. I haven't even seen the old. I, I haven't seen the old. Oh, I used to watch the old. I used to definitely. I had toys of the I had the old toys back in the Did you watch the new one? What'd you uh, not, not really. Couldn't really get into it. Started, couldn't really get into it. And there's a whole thing here, by the way, about in light of 2020, where there's a part of Battlestar Galactic that's kind of not funny anymore about like the idea of like Cy- us creating the Cylons, Cylons and then the Cylons becoming sentient and then the Cylons creating like fleshy, fleshy mm-hmm. meat flesh and then like trying to learn what it is to be human. And like, let's not mention the fact that like spoilers for a show from 15 years ago, but like um, all the it, it's not set on Earth. It, you think you're kind of led to believe that it's kind of maybe on earth but it's totally not uh it's like a whole tribe of like father are you familiar with this at all 
okay anyway no. so it's like yeah basically they're they leave and they're all pagans like everyone from that from the human civilization is pagans they worship the gods yes so that's they, right they say gods darn it you know or yep. you know gods you're absolutely you know pissing me off or whatever um and then all the cylons are monotheistic they believe in the loving god the judeo-christian god and which is not the judeo-christian god but like they come in and their whole thing is so in light of 2020 all of that stuff is not very funny anymore it was like oh wow look at these these wacky machines and then not to mention that like i mean it's just kind of overshades of nephilim but whatever you know it's just it is what it is i'm sure a lot of that was on purpose without a doubt i mean because the cylons eventually become sympathetic oh come on these poor like robots like they don't know what they're doing and humanity treated them so poorly in the first place that's why they're rebelling blah 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 Mm -hmm. but i still love it it's just it is what it is if you take it for what it is it's genuinely some of the best tv ever created so people people loved that reboot they loved that it was it had such the cult following when it was on the air I just, I think I maybe tried two episodes and it was yeah, just. So I'm, we got to cut it off here because otherwise we're going to get angry yeah. comments okay. again. But <laughs> I got to say, get through the first two episodes because okay. literally okay. the third episode, the okay. entire tone changes like okay. instantly. It's like okay. overnight where the Cylons are attacking the humans every 33 minutes. And it's like, okay. it's really. 33. 33. <laughs> there's tons of religious overtone in this show like tons and Man. tons of religious overtone in the show but it's like so it's not enough time for anybody to sleep and they don't have enough time for they don't have enough crew for like people to zonk out and someone else to take over so pretty much yeah, everyone I'll is just it, i'll getting, give it a try i'll give it a try and see what happens i could even <laughs> go so far as get on the good old wikipedia and find out what happens in the first two episodes and then oh. watching from the third episode if, oh, that might not be a bad idea. Yeah, I'm just saying. There's a bunch that of might good not be a bad idea. So, anyway, cool. so yeah. sorry about the. Um, I'm now. I'm not talking to you, Cyprian, anymore. I'm talking to the our our uh, viewers. That sorry that it's been an inconsistent release schedule. It's Lent, and it is Lent. God willing, we continue this podcast. Every Lent is probably going to be like this. Every fasting season is going to be irregular because we're we're busy praying so we're busy this has been i I must say this last 10 days to two weeks has been notably spiritually difficult for me Mm. like notably but i can't put my but not i'm not able to put my finger on it exactly right so i can't point to any one thing but i can just point it's just a general feeling of oppression not oppression necessarily but like like pulling a heavy weight like you know a what cross I mean? like a cross if it were oh could, could <laughs> yeah that would that would, <laughs> that would be yes yes i it's strange that i didn't think that but yeah that's exactly <laughs> what <laughs> That's not an Andrew Funker Ridge. That's in our hymnography. Like, every- <laughs> yeah, that's if that's what the closely, last two weeks felt like. If you look yeah. closely at the Orthodox Christian faith, you'll see something about a cross in there. If you look <laughs> <laughs> If I were to be George Costanza from Seinfeld right now, I'd be like, all right, folks, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm not going to get any better than that. Yeah, yeah, it's uh yeah, it's been it's been notable, man, but like not fr- but not frustrating, which is which has also been interesting to me. Cuz I think when I've had in the past when I've had spiritual mo- periods of spiritual difficulty, it's been very very frustrating. You know. I don't know, there was this time a long time ago. I don't know if Father remembers this interaction. But I remember now he remembers this part, but something happened to his car that he had just bought at the beginning of Lent. Like his window got smashed out out of the back of his um, out of his car and he had just bought it. 
And I remember he was talking to a sister from the church. And I don't know if he remembers this interaction, but it stuck out in my brain that he was talking to her and she has kind of newly baptized, maybe within the faith for like, maybe like, I don't know, like nine months or a year or something like that. And then he kind of ended the conversation and talking about what had happened with, oh, it's Lent. It's Lent. What are you going to do? And she was like, what's that mean? <laughs> and it was like, so like, oh, whoa, yeah, there's a time where you couldn't just say it's Lent and everyone would be like, mm, I get what you're talking about. Yeah. And that's refreshing. That's refreshing to have that kind of interaction with someone. Yeah. Yeah. What does it mean, Father? Well, Lent is the time in which all the cosmos brings its eyes to the, the God's economy of salvation for mankind. That's, that's, I mean, the demons rage because our Lord's passion, his death and resurrection are the front, front and center of, of, of everything, you know? So people, the people of God are purifying themselves. The people of God are being purified by God. The people of God are um, at least, you know, supposed to be putting their attention to the things of God and, and really their salvation. You know, like for a lot of people, the bulk of their, you know, 80% of their, 80% <laughs> of their yearly kind of like work of salvation is done during Lent, you know, so uh, there's a lot that, that just happens there, but, you know, they call it the purple demon, the purple demons come out for a reason, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's what's the purple demon? Well, the purples are liturgical color, like the colors change, mm -hmm. right? And so the purple demons, we call them as that, which is funny because the emoji, uh, at least on iPhones for demons are purple. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, think about it. <coughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, purple comes out liturgically. It's like the purple demons, they, they start showing up, you know, it's, they don't call it great light for nothing, you know? So it's like, things break, people get sick, stuff happens, you know, that's why certain things like, generally speaking, like don't travel during Lent, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's good not to travel during Lent. Um, you know, it's, it's good to just kind of be still and not just for the sake of, of course, to be collected and to pray, but also, you know, hunker down and just, you know, stuff happens during Lent, you know, just, ex just expect it, you know, so. I've even noticed people who are even just like a little bit in contact spiritually, yep, they get affected. Mm -hmm. They, they get grumpy too. I'm thinking of this particular guy. He's real grumpy right now and he's attributing it to all sorts of different things to him. And it's just like, I keep just wanting to be like, it's Lent bro. It's Lent. I mean, it's funny. Cause for a lot of, I mean, sure. On one level, you can say, Oh, people are fasting. They're abstaining from stuff, whatever, but yeah. Uh, that's not really the answer because even people like you said who aren't in the church but are kind of like in orbit of the church um and even people who are in the church but aren't really fasting it's like the, the gravitational pull of lent is mighty so yeah it's been a, it, it has been no it's just it's it's been particularly notable yeah like i i, I mean i it's just yet another one of those things with of, of the, the realness of orthodoxy, like just mm -hmm. brought home again to me because I, you know, I've always been searching for, if I was going to have any spiritual practice, it would have to show itself as real, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it, there would, there are things. And I mean, those who, I, I mean, I know, you know, father, but it's like, I'm not going to participate in something that's where I'm imagining Something yeah, like I mean, it's funny because I, I look back on, you know, so much of evangelical life. Or, I mean, honestly, to to a greater degree, evangelical life, because even my my few years really kind of like um, in the occult, quote unquote, uh, there was much more of a kind of objective um, experience where I could point to things and other people could point to those experiences being outside of myself and be like yeah see the evangelical life is just it's so subjective and mm. um which to me i point to it just kind of like of the delusional like nature of it um but you know you come into orthodoxy it's like you begin encountering things that are like 
you know, outside of you objectively and that are like all are all but empirical. You can point to them and be like, see this, this and this. And even getting back to what we were talking about earlier, it's like, well, like I've told people, it's like the, one of the ways and if not the main ways I know Christ is in my life beyond just my own kind of personal devotion, my experiences personally, subjectively is I have these crosses, <laughs> which I would have never picked for myself. That's, that's how I know Christ is in my life. I have these crosses. I don't, I've, I didn't want them, don't want them per se. Um, but I, but I've learned to embrace them and they're life giving to me. Right. So, and, and they are, you know, fairly objective, you know, they're, you know, they can be to some degree measured. I can point to them outside of myself and people can say like, oh yeah, this, this, and this, you know? So that's, I think that's something that's important that we can, we can miss out on. And then, you know, you begin to realize the, the, the reality of participating in something larger than yourself. And I don't just mean like your own observations, your own personal feelings, but even in regards of time, you know, you can point to something that, you know, um, is stamped in history and is, is bigger than your national identity. That, that's something people don't think about a lot, um, but it's just one more of the many evidences and one more of the many points of, of truth and connection that orthodoxy is, you know, the, that the church of Jesus Christ is, I mean, cause really that that's what is, what is orthodoxy, but it's, it's the practice of living the life of the church inside the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's orthodoxy is the church. Like, you know, let's, let's not look at it. Like it's, you know, something kind of separate from that. Like that's, that's what it is. Orthodoxy is it's the church. So the larger identity concept is one that I, I, I found myself in, in conversation with people because it's something that I think about a lot. And especially mm -hmm. now, um, seeing that there is such a drive for people to like fragment into the tiniest identity that they could possibly have. Like that's the drive of the wokes mm -hmm. is like, let me label myself and lead with an identity where like, it's literally a one person identity because I just invented this. I identify as an attack helicopter or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like the, the ability to, and, and the, the, what would I say? The potency, the, I mean, it's a blessing to be able to have an, an identity that is like so much bigger, even the nation, any of those things and to be like, this person's my brother, this person's my brother, this person's my brother, this person's my brother, my sister in Christ is like, mm -hmm. for somebody to not take that opportunity to have something like that, it's, it just seems like you've missed the whole idea of what it, what the purpose of an identity is in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, too, to get even to drill down on it, that's the whole problem, too, with um, people not understanding what it means to be in the church. To be in the church means to be in Christ and like understanding what that means. And, uh, you know, you begin to measure what it means to be human appropriately, you know, like, so in other words, you measure your, human your humanity in the light of, of the person of Jesus Christ. Like that's what it, you wanna know what it means to be human? You have to look at Jesus Christ, he is the human he is the man he is the human so um and that's you know this is all stuff we've talked about before right but this is the hypostatic principle of saint Sophroni, and this is essentially why we have we have to study the lives of the saints right because if the gospels are the are the the means by which the the lives and the teachings of the lord jesus are are you know, given to the world in an objective sense, because there is a, there's a personal experience of that, but objective sense, right, then the lives of the saints are the way that that is, you know, processed and digested to some, de to some degree, because it's, you know, the wrong understanding of the scriptures is what dominates. So in other words, people think they know what they're reading when they read the gospels, and many times they don't. Um, and so therefore, there's so many bad interpretations, so much wrong doctrine, so much delusion, right? The lives of the saints show us what it means. And not only in the sense of just simply making it kind of safe and palatable, but the lives of the saints are where you get so much of the marrow and the, and the nuance of what, what a teaching of our Lord is, or what a doctrine and a commandment of the Lord is. You know, I mean, there's so much 
in the lives of the saints where you're like, okay, well, this actually explains how this aspect of my life can be integrated into the life of, of Christ, which is being in the church. If, if any of that, what I'm saying makes sense, you know? I have a it question. Makes, it makes a lot of sense. Go ahead, Andrew. I'm going to do this in the middle of the show too. I'm going to ask you guys a question and it's related. Do you guys have like right off the top of your head, because I've, I've got one right off the top of my head, a favorite story of a life of a saint. Um, because I, I can vamp for just one second to give you guys just a minute to think, because the one I've been going on about right now that I'm just crazy about is the, I'm reading the life of Papa Nicholas. Um, and uh, he worked on this church um and he's first off incredible loads and loads of stories from this guy's life but he worked at this church and i guess there's this groundskeeper there who just despised him he just did not like him and uh would like make like rude gestures to him behind his back i think she was a woman the groundskeeper and one night while she was sleeping um saint john the forerunner appeared to her in the dream and was like what's up like why do you not like papa nicholas and she was like and like open her mouth and he slapped her across the face and she woke up with this huge bruise on her face and um she went up and prostrated for papa nicholas and he's like of course that's not necessary that's not necessary and she left and became a nun a nun named matrona so um and then the other and, one and that is crazy that is absolutely crazy that you said matrona because that's my favorite a story of life of a saint oh, is boy. Matrona of Moscow. Oh, here we go. Bro. <laughs> so, Stop it right now. I'm just gonna say this right here now. we go. <laughs> Stop it right now. Everything just shifted. No. <laughs> so my wife is actually five months pregnant, and the saint that we've picked out for her is Saint Matrona. Because, like, yeah. <laughs> my daughter, my first daughter is Saint Zenia. And uh, St. Matron and St. Zenia are tight. So, um, yeah. But anyway, none named Matrona. That is really wild, bro. Yeah. So, through the prayers of St. Wow. Matrona. But then the um, other one is there was, um, I just got to say this because I love it so much that this is, see, this to me is where the lives of the saints are so important because sometimes I think I have to act a certain way. And there's this way to like graft my personality and like take the good and leave the bad. And this is one of those examples of um, there was a bishop. I think he was talking to a monk who is writing an icon and he had put St. Nicholas in the same icon as the mother of God in Christ. And the bishop was like, you cannot do that. He's not important enough saint to do that. Like take him out and, you know, end of story. And so the monk was like, okay. And on the way back, uh, I think it was from an island. A bishop was on a, 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 a boat and storm happened. He fell into the water and he was crying out and uh, St. Nicholas appeared before him. He's like, are you sure? Are you sure I can help you? Can I help you? I'm not strong enough to help you. I'm apparently not important enough to help you. And the bishop repented and went back and told him, let's leave him in the icon, leave him in the icon. It's totally fine. But that's one of those moments of being like, that's like, that's like spiritual heroin for me. Cause I'm just like, Oh yes, that is so good for me to hear that because then, and St. Gabriel burning the, um, the Bolshevik. Portrait of Lenin. Yeah. Portrait of Lenin, all that stuff. It's just like, so do you guys have a favorite story of a saint? Right off the top of your head. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, I got, uh, there's two that I always just, they're so pivotal for me. The first one is uh, St. Nesitas, obviously. I mean, I talked so much about, I've talked about him before, you know. I bring him up a lot too, yeah. Yeah, St. Nesitas and the, you know, falling into prelist and um, being beguiled by an angel of light. Um, but the other one, and um, he came up, uh, what, two days ago. And, uh, oh, I love him. I actually... I was in a, I was in a band with uh, my kid sister. Shout out to Marita. Um, I wrote, wrote a song about him actually, but Daxiotis, mm. the tale of Daxiotis and the terrible toll houses. Oh, oh, I just read this. Oh, so, oh. I mean, so what, is, great. what is this story? So basically, uh, Daxiotis was he was 
it's interesting because you know he's um he's a faithful guy he's like a servant um and you know kind of fairly pious guy faithful guy um but he falls into adultery um with his master's wife i think it was i think it was his worker's wife was building out i don't mean to correct i think yeah, it was please, worker's please. wife yeah thank it you. was building a house for him or something like that and it was his workers i just read this right so he falls into adultery with her faithful guy but he falls and then um a serpent like a camera what he's doing like he's building something so he moves the rocks but a serpent bites him and kills him mm. and he's dying he dies and basically he goes he goes to the toll houses and of course the toll house of adultery he gets stopped and um uh i can't remember that's obviously not that favorite if i can't remember the detail but he gets sent back basically and he basically comes back from the dead and he goes from church to church just bewailing the 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 horrors of the toll houses banging his head against the door that's the best part banging like, head against lamenting the door. and mourning and just crying out to the people to repent uh and telling them of the terrors of the toll houses and after like after like 48 hours and like he dies and that's that so Dope. It's, yeah it's it's incredible i mean it, it's it's incredible because again it's i don't know you can tell i'm into i'm into saints that give like these crazy warnings so you know saint asitas about prelist and just thinking that you you know prelist you know full stop but with daxiotis again you know he was faithful and he fell and then you know the warning of the toll houses but also too it's like the just the i'm always just struck to the core of saints who have this they're like compelled to almost on, like on the level of like a prophet live out these lives these acts of like extreme repentance mm. you know and and proclamation of repentance something about it to me is just really powerful um but i just want to give one more if i can yeah, yeah absolutely of course it, that's why we're here uh man jacob Jacob, you know, uh, Jacob and Esau, Jacob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. Wow. I mean, I was reading, uh, the reading today um, in Genesis was um, the account of him and Esau and his, basically his deception of, of his father. Yeah. And every time I read that, I just go like, man, like Jacob is the Old Testament trickster. And yeah it's just incredible to me like you read you you read that and you're like what is going on i mean <laughs> like like isaac the whole time is like hold on you sound like jacob but, <laughs> mm -hmm. but like but you you don't feel like jacob and you smell like esau but like you don't you know it's just all it's so detailed like all the points of like well how did that happen they're all covered in that in that account but there's so much there's so much there because number one it shows you how someone can read it and just kind of project their own human sense of quote-unquote fairness and totally miss what's happening there you know it's like oh Esau got ripped off and it's like no 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 Esau didn't care about his birthright that's he didn't, right he didn't care yeah. about it see that's um, the part I didn't know yeah, yeah. Esau doesn't he, Esau sold his Esau sold his birthright for, he traded it for like, I'll give my birthright for like a bowl of stew. Food. Yeah, for yeah, food. Yeah, bowl of stew. <laughs> so then he he doesn't care about his birthright. He, he didn't really care about the blessing, right? And so he didn't care about the things of God in that sense. But the but the flip of that is, although Jacob is of this guy of a, of a questionable moral character, he does believe and does take the promises and the things of God seriously. And, I, and it's just so important because I think one of the biggest things that people need to turn a corner on, it's, and when people especially convert to orthodoxy outside of becoming evangelical and being an American is like, Americans were such glad handers and we're so like, it was just pure, you were just Puritans. And we think that to be a Christian, you have to be this saccharine, 
Pollyanna-ish, you know, dote that doesn't, you know, it, it, it's not the case at all. And you look at someone like, you look at someone um, like Jacob, you look at these saints, you look, Daxiotis, you know, you look at uh, Nasitas, you look at these, that's why I think I like them because in some ways they're a kind of like a type of an anti-hero in the sense mm-hmm. that they they present the fact that God isn't interested in what God doesn't judge according to the ways that man judges. Mm-hmm. And there's 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 a devotion, there's a grit, there's I, you know, I would even dare say, um yeah, there, there's just this devotion. There's this, mm, there's just something about. Uh, a person who is radical, wild, wild in their love that you that you just see God um, has a has a heart for, you know. And so these stories kind of really reveal that to me. Anyways, so Father, who is that saint? Um, a man. I was really close with this guy during early sobriety. Saint Bar. He. It's Bar something. I can't remember. Arsenius? Maybe he was basically living with his mistress in an improper way. Oh, Boniface. Boniface. Oh, man. Boniface, Boniface is another great one. Man. I remember that was one of the first times, aside from St. Andrew, I felt like a real, wait, what's up with this guy? Yeah, like, what's St. Up Boniface. Yeah, St. Boniface lived with his mistress. I mean, total just debaucherous you know, wanton life. And she kind of becomes infatuated with, with the kind of idea of Christians and all this. And she's almost like his superstitious sense was like, oh, you know, she hears about these pilgrimages and getting relics. Like, oh, I would love to have like a relic or something like that. And he basically says, well, you know, would you accept, would you accept me if I, you know, Basically, would you accept me if I like got you one or, or you know? He was like, what if I came back as a relic? What if I came back if, as a relic? Yeah, whatever. what if I basically. came back as a relic? Yeah. So he goes off to pilgrimage and he, he gets martyred, basically. Um, and he's, you know, his remains are sent back to her, you know, and she converts she, and lives, yeah. lives this pious life, you know, but it's it's wild. I mean, the, his confession of because he goes he makes pilgrimage or whatever but not really because he's not really a believer but he sees the, these martyrs and is just absolutely cut to the quick and converts and offers himself to be martyred mm. and you know here's this total debaucherous playboy <laughs> who just you know makes this incredible conversion that's that yeah, same one this is a great one mm-hmm. this this is I think that this actually this conversation right here and talking and and seeing the seeing like the layout of all of these saints and how it like like you say the marrow how it fleshes out the the teaching how it fleshes out Christ like this it's interesting because I think that this is that this exactly if we're going by if we're still on the creed then where we're at now is uh so we're at uh, he shall come again in glory to judge the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. So like the, the understanding of the kingdom mm-hmm. and that these all as being examples of like, is this the outline of the kingdom? Is this the blueprint of the kingdom? Like, is this the map of the kingdom? Is the, li- is the lives of the saints? Can yeah. we think of that as the map of the kingdom? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the lives of the saints um I, don't, I i mean the the kingdom of heaven is within you and this kind of gets to my point earlier is like a lot of people miss the kingdom because they are judging it by these external standards which that's not it and the lie of the saints they become this cipher by what you by which you begin to actually see what the kingdom looks like because really the kingdom's kind of Man, God forgive me. I might be going out on a limb here, but no one cares. We're just um, to we're our just millions off. of listeners. Yeah, our millions of listeners, right? So to some degree, to some degree, I think it's I think it's fair to say, although easily misinterpreted when I'm about to say, I think. Um, 
I mean, the kingdom of heaven is hidden. It's veiled. It's, I mean, the Lord's clear. That's why he spoke in parables in that sense. But like, if you, like on the one hand, it's a paradox. On the one hand, if you just look at the gospels as they've been revealed strictly in the gospels, what did I just say? <laughs> that didn't make sense. If you look at the life of Christ, just as they're revealed strictly in the gospels, forgive me. It, on the one hand, it's everything you need, but on the other hand, it's almost completely to see what the, it's almost impossible to see what the kingdom is, if you understand what I'm saying, because, and, and the proof of that is, look at, look at all the people who are not in the church, <laughs> right? Look at all the Protestants, look at, all, look, look at everyone else, and, and, and let's, I don't mean like individuals and people, but just like, it's, it's obviously not that clear because if it was, you wouldn't have a gajillion sex and you wouldn't have a gajillion interpretations. Even like people like Gandhi, you know, like, you know, Christ I like, but you're, you Christians I hate, like all that stuff. It's like, if, if you're just going off of the gospel, just going off the scripture, you, it's almost impossible to, to see what, it, what the kingdom is, right? forgive me i'm beating i'm belaboring a point but there's so many um there's so many academics there's so many uh, adherents to you know higher criticism they know nothing of the kingdom right they can talk about codex and all that stuff but they don't know anything about the kingdom right i mean tons of biblical scholars that i've studied don't know anything about the kingdom they can sure. tell you about the Bible, maybe, quote, unquote. They don't know anything about the kingdom. I'm just trying to, like, really get a point across, right? But you can read the lives of the saints and you in, and not really know much about the Gospels and about the Scriptures in, in the kind of, like, explicit sense and get your kind of badge Get your, you know, your map to the kingdom in a, in a, in a really, not just profound, but explicit and accessible way. And, and, and this scandalizes people. I mean, who cares, right? Like, no one listening is going to be, maybe they will, but I mean, you can just look at the Orthodox church and just kind of like see that because there's so many people who are not really versed in the scriptures. They're not really versed and that's not okay. It's not okay. It's not, it's not okay. It shouldn't be that way. But nevertheless, the fact of the matter is, is, but they're, but they're living in the kingdom. They have experience of the kingdom, right? So there's something to that. There's something, there really is something to that. I have a really like good, it's, it's, it's so like sorry. living in a place and you may not like, you could live in a place like here. You wouldn't have to know who the governor was you wouldn't have to necessarily have read the history of the place and all of that, but you're living inside of it. And you could describe like, what is this place that you're living? You've mm -hmm. had this experience of it, even though like you haven't necessarily read the laws that are there and you don't, you know, what, whatever you're not, you're not part of whatever elite uh, elite people or have whatever kind of information, but that you could know and you could describe from your experience, like what is this place that I'm living? Probably better than people who are studying the Island could probably better oh, yeah 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 somebody could well, be an academic and they could be like oh yeah i've studied the marianas and it's like have you ever lived there right. that's no. Joe's gas station. that's that's teddy's cousin or whatever you know right. 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 i have like a really good example for this father i'm sorry really quick because i think it's it would be accessible to someone like me but on like the the movie the island uh the russian movie mm -hmm. um, yeah love that movie love it uh, i was watching that because I try, I'm trying, I'm not doing a very good job to have like edifying things on my gigantic TV in my office while I'm working. And I had that on and a Protestant friend of mine was sitting there watching it. He'd never seen it before. And the part where he's like laying into that girl because she wants to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. And he's like, gosh, he's a jerk. I was like, no, he is. Well, maybe he is, but he's doing God's work there. And like that, that is where that... I think that maybe that connection can be made because I mean, it is not an actual saint, but that movie does a really good job to depicting of a person 
that is able to like say that kind of stuff and you still kind of like feel like the holy like love from it like it's it's portrayed really well so the life of a saint this made up saint father antinoli is like yelling at this woman because she wants to have an abortion and he's basically like just thinking like why would this quote unquote holy person because i told him the premise of the movie why would he be talking to someone like that is it because like he is exactly because he is quote unquote holy that he is talking to that person like that it may come across as mean but this is like the gospel in action quote unquote i say quote unquote because it's a movie yeah but- i mean i mean the oh gosh there's that's you you're bringing up a really great point andrew because I would submit the problem isn't the movie or even like this idea of quote unquote portraying meanness, but like the problem is us that we look at anything that isn't assuaging our sins in our sycophantic, weak, absolutely, you know, infantile, self centered disposition as modern people. Anything that isn't just coddling that is, is wrong. And, and that's, that's the problems that we're twisted, that we see anything outside of just absolute nanny state, nanny world is just like bad. That, that's the problem. But the second thing I want to say is also the thing that people miss about the lives of the saints that people can't, that I think if you don't get this, this is where, if you don't know this, then you're not going to get it, which is, um, you actually commune when you enter into communion with the saints. So when we talk about the experience of the kingdom, it isn't just like you're reading about the Marianas Islands. Like by reading the lives of the saints and praying to them, it's not exhaustively that, but you begin the process of communing with them, right? So in essence, it's like, you're not really just, it's not just about reading a letter about your uncle, you're actually getting in contact with your uncle. It's a, it's a, it's a very different thing. And, and until you've had that experience of communing with the saint, to be like, oh no, I know, I know him. You don't, you don't, it doesn't make sense, you don't get it. But once, you, once it's happened to you, you're like, oh yeah, like the saints, they're real. Their intercessions are real and you can actually get to know them and you can see that they know you. That's crazy to some people, but it's true. And, and that's another reason why I think looking at, you know, reading the lives of the saints is more important. I mean, honestly, for a lot of people, I've said this before, it's just, there's so many people I'd be like, you know what, it's, it's more important that you read the lives of the saints, maybe at this point in your spiritual life. Um, now there's a given there, just not to scandalize anybody, but there's a given. You're hearing the gospel you know, in the services, you're, you're encountering the gospel. I'm not, it's not like an either or type of thing. You know what I mean? But there's something qualitatively different in regards of the encounter uh, with the saints. It in, may be in like regards a, of entering the kingdom and knowing the kingdom and experiencing the kingdom. So it may be like a mountain and the gospel is more towards the top. Thank you so much. And like sometimes it may be harder to like access it. And so the, the lives of the saints can kind of be like a way to like kind of bring that information down to you. Like, cause you still want to climb the mountain. Right. But like the gospel, are you, are you with me? Like, yes. Okay. So it's like, you still see it, but it's still kind of hard to like see, but like you can kind of look to the left and the right and the saints like, yeah, be careful about this next Valley. It's like really difficult to get through there. So you want to make sure you only go through these times or something like that. I came up with that on the fly, that metaphor on the fly. So if it's not great, that's why. And I just, I think that, I think this encounter part is the part that as I've, as, as I've spoken with, with people and they've tried to understand like, well, what is the people who've known me in the past? Right. And with my conversion and they're like, it's not, nobody has said this is out of character, like that my conversion somehow seems out of character for me, but they're just like, it's very interesting. Like, this is a, like, talk to me about this. And I think that this encounter part, the encounter of the encounter of the kingdom, the actual encounter, this is the place that even those people who I know who are Christians, who uh, of the evangelical or non-denominational 
you know, bent. That's the part that they can't, they just can't get around. Like for me, because of the past <coughs> occult, occult stuff, no problem. Mm-hmm. Like encounters with the spiritual, uh, people who are in the occult, they or have, have experienced the occult, they have no problem with that. That part, they're like, totally fine, right? But it is very interesting to me that this aspect of our faith that is so forward in encounter honor saints the encounter is it you're cutting out Are there here no? can... Can... we lost you at a counter okay the encounter the encounter with saints the encounter with our lord the encounter with the theotokos this is the place where that i always feel this sense of like it's interesting because it seems like it's a sense of dread fear like when i'm talking with evangelicals that it's like the idea that they would have an encounter is immediately like like almost like that's not supposed to happen even some some roman catholics that i've talked to like uh i don't know now we're talking about something that doesn't sound like christianity to me and that's been very that's been very interesting and maybe like the biggest difference, but also the biggest, the thing that's attracted me most to orthodoxy and the thing that makes it the most real is that, is that the encounter is, the encounter is what we're striving for. Right. Well, you know, I mean, this is where we get into why certain things, well, everything matters, but like, I mean, what, what is Protestantism except for the kind of secularization of Christianity? You know what I mean? And the rash, it's, it's the, it's the kind of Protestantism is taking a Christian veneer or religious veneer, quote unquote, and, uh, and wrapping it, wrapping rationalism up with it. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's so, it's so far removed, not just historically, but but the ethos of it, the experience of it, I mean, it's just so far removed from, from Christianity. And I think I think the thing is for some people they hear this and it's just such strong talk, but um when man, when you begin to experience the kingdom, let me let me digress a little bit. Um, this is this is kind of timely for me because I don't know I don't know what it is, but I feel even today, I was listening to uh, a kind of you know community conversation, Catholic on Catholic radio, and they're interviewing um, a couple of quote unquote black pastors in regards of race relations and things like that. And um, I'm sorry, Father, I couldn't hear that last part. I think. Oh, here's- sorry. Uh, I was listening to. God. <laughs> It's not my microphone. It's me just kind of drifting off into my own inner world, mumbling. Um, so okay. I've read from the lives of saints that that's okay to do. So yeah, well, so so even so, this kingdom thing has been coming up a lot for me lately, even today, right? So this is a Catholic radio, and there was kind of like a, a community discussion um, with you know whatever Catholic talk show host. And um, you know, a couple of quote unquote black pastors, and this topic of kingdom, you know, principles and, and the use of kingdom as a kind of like ecumenical cover all, right? So it kind of doesn't really matter what your traditional experience is, we can all get down to the basics of like what's kingdom living, you know what I mean? This is the way that most people kind of would experience this talk of kingdom now. Like if you were to separate, and again, you know, we don't have really too many people listening, but if people were keying into this, I think there's a lot of people be like, oh, this kingdom principle thing, I understand that. They're, they'd be familiar with it, right? They'd be familiar with this term kingdom and what does it mean and, and all this stuff. But the thing is, is when we're talking about the kingdom and what they're talking about the kingdom are like two different things. Because when they're talking about kingdom, they're talking about, morals and and like sets of morals and sets of behavior that are that are undergirded by you know doctrinal principles 
That's that's how they describe the kingdom. For us, that's not the kingdom. That's an aspect of the kingdom, sure. You know, I don't want to go too far in, in my like polemic, but like for us, the kingdom is persons. Like how, like as an Orthodox Christian, how do I understand the kingdom? Well, it doesn't really matter, you know, necessarily where I'm living or even to some degree, like, you know, uh, who I am, it's who do I know? That's, that's my experience of the kingdom. Like, do you know the mother of God? Do you know the saints? You know what I mean? Like, do you know, do you know Christ? How do you experience Christ? Oh, I mean, you experience Christ in the liturgy. And that's, that's like, for so many people, that's just what, like it, 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 it's, it smacks of, you know, superstition and like, and, and all these, th and all these things. Right. But when you really look at it, it's their understanding. Of the kingdom is just, like I said, it has nothing to do with persons, but look in a kingdom, there's a King and there's, and there's the King's court and the subjects and, and the, the people, right? What is a nation? What is a kingdom? It's, 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 it's comprised of, of persons. The laws and the morality and the dictates of a kingdom mean nothing if there, if there isn't, if it isn't populated by people. Who are who are connected if you're understanding what i'm saying so yeah. it's, it's just the the approach the approach is is often um devoid of of that kind of and that and that's why for us it's uh, getting back to saint gregor palmas like even understand the arguments of saint gregor palmas against barlam and how that can be interpreted in, in like the contemporary sense of you know rationalism, philosophical thought, academic, you know, um, scholasticism, all that. that's all there. But at the end of the day, what St. Gregory is telling us is like, you have to experience God through the heart and you, and the only, and what you experience in the heart is not necessarily discursive, rational arguments and syllogistic, you know, <laughs> thought, you know, thoughts, all that stuff, blah, blah, blah. It, it's persons, it's love. It's, that's what the kingdom is, right? So, this measure of of understanding the kingdom this measure of quote unquote even being orthodox it's not a matter of what you know but who and that's why getting back to almost in a kind of self-conscious way our project here so much of it is just really trying you know those who i, ho I hope and pray there's still more and more people interested in orthodoxy and that they're getting a hold of this and i'm hoping that they're hearing what's being said because i just i get the sense there's still a lot of people who are, who are not crossing this crossing this threshold of, of understanding like this isn't the place if you're looking for a dry um, systematic you know kind of uh, litany of validation or, or like you know proofs proofs of like le historical legitimacy blah blah it's like this is the place where you come to know God this is the place where you come to know the people of God on a personal level and and it's it, it makes all the difference in the world of whether you actually become orthodox or whether you join a quote unquote you know kind of institution you know this idea of the and even maybe not even being able to really understand even the rules and the laws of a kingdom without having a an encounter and not just an encounter but a relationship with the persons of um, oh, you're cutting to me. Oh. You're cutting out again, man. Oh, well, it's hitting home to me because I'm in Saipan, right? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's hitting home to me because I'm in Saipan, which is like the exact reason why the I'm probably cutting out. But it's like this is coming here and experiencing, and even people that you know, Father, like people who have thought that they're going to come here because they've read things on paper and they've seen like the laws on paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right and it's like oh yeah that looks like the u.s because it's written like the u.s it's a u.s territory and all of those things mm -hmm. and they think that they're and then they're they're shook mm -hmm. because they're like wait but that's not what's happening on the ground here like that's yeah. not they're not going by what's on the paper and it's like no 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 that's it if you stop and take in the whole experience and now relook at the paper and you'll see they're they're doing exactly what's on the paper 
It's just not happening in the way that you had interpreted right. it. Right. Like once, and then once you're here, then you're like, oh yeah, no, it's exactly what's on the paper. Right. right. Honestly, Supreme, forgive me. Like it's a bit vague and cryptic. So people may not get it, but it's a perfect example. It's a perfect example that you gave because that's exactly, that's exactly what it is. You know, it's, People have this idea of what the kingdom is because they've read the Bible. They read. They think that's what it is, and then you encounter you you encounter orthodoxy in its totality, not just someone who attends the local church, but even the saints, right? And it's like, no, no, like they'll be like, "What is this? This is not what I thought it was." Whatever. This isn't Christian. This, you know, there's there's a guy. God bless him. There's a catechumen, right? God bless him. Who you know. Uh, know him because of you, Supreme, right? There's a catechumen and his wife has given him like the hardest time. And it's just, you know, I really feel for him because it's just kind of like, she's, that's, you know, Orthodox, he's not Christian. Like all these just actually uh, like just so, they're just so absurd. And you just can't help but feel sorry for someone because they're just the most ignorant statements that a person can make. But uh, you can also understand, you know, I just, I understand where she's coming from, whatever, but God willing, he'll grant her to see. And she, and when she sees, she'll be like, oh, oh, this is it. Yeah. I thought, you know, I thought it was this, but actually the way it is here, this is exactly what the kingdom is. Cause that's been all of our experience. We've been like, oh, 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 okay. Now I get it. You know what I mean? Mm. So, by the way, I think my mountain example was better than students <laughs> thing. I'm just going to say that. But I remember that 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 was something that immediately I got. No, not immediately. It was a it was like a couple of years in because um, my heart was not in the right place for a number of reasons. But um, I remember just going insane, trying to live by a law. Mm -hmm. and like trying to figure out logically kind of to a degree because it was more than that but I was like logically to a degree about like well do I do this or do I that because I can come up with arguments on both sides why both things are bad and both good mm -hmm. so it's not even like I'm ending up in one of two places I'm ending up in like one of six places mm -hmm. and all I kind of did was just kind of close my eyes and throw the dart at the board and hope that like something stuck and then when I actually started coincidentally enough paying attention more to saints, I was like, oh, wait, no, it's a person. It's a person I'm following. And it's like, it's not just some dry code. And then, you know, that's the, that's the journey of most people. I mean, you know, you start out in the Israel and mm -hmm. in, in old Israel and you're following a law and then you end up kind of a Pharisee for a little while. And then a revelation happens and then love gets introduced love gets thrown in the mix you mm -hmm. know and then that's a game changer mm -hmm. so that's all i got to say about that that's it i, I that I, I was pretty <laughs> cool. no, that's kidding. all i got to say about See that. Later. <laughs> out guys <laughs> well the and and also and it's so missing it's so missing right now i mean now in a time where so many people have lost any especially over the last two years right so many people have lost any faith or any hope in the idea of their nation mm -hmm. um in the idea of you know their whatever their their country or their culture is like so many people have have lost it and seen like oh it's disconnected there's not like there it's it's us and them mm -hmm. even to the point where now you know i guess we're in a world war right now and the any patriotism is like pure signaling mm -hmm. there's no i even when i was even looking back at like 9 11 and, and all of that like patriotism patriotism was real like that was only 20 years ago and i remember viscerally being able to feel it like coming from out of people, a, a pride in their country. Mm -hmm. um, but even now, even, you know, countries at war and whatnot. And it's like, 
you know, even talking with my wife and her friends and whatnot. And it's like, even, even that patriotism is like, it's just, it's just not the same. And I think that a lot of it is because there, there isn't this feeling that there is a, that there is a king or a president or a ruler or something like that, that has any love whatsoever. You know, like, I think that at least, and maybe, I don't know, maybe people were misguided or misled, or maybe even that was why I was, you know, with the things that happened in 2001 and all of that, and looking at, you know, where I was at politically and looking at George Bush and be like, wow, you really hardcore cut out again. I'm so sorry. You said looking at George Bush and right. then you're like, <laughs> I was just like, oh, is it my mic? Is it my Maybe mic? It is. Maybe it is. No, it's just my internet connection is stable. You no, know, it's it's that, that, there, that there's no love. Basically, that that there's not a ruler. That that there's a a feeling, an overall feeling globally that like there is not a ruler to look to on Earth where anybody feels like there's any love coming. What from a that great person. underhand pitch on so many levels, right? I mean, let's go meta. So the. The pitch here in regards of, I want to just, I was going to say before you went there, Supreme was like, we would be remiss if we didn't cover and his, you know, the kingdom having no end and the eternal nature of communion and experiencing that love, right? And this gets us to this thing of like, well, people are waking up to the reality that like, you know, nation states, they're, they don't have the shelf life that people thought they did. And, and even the state of, even this idea of, of what it means to be, um, I mean, I can't speak, I don't, I'm overreaching now because I wouldn't know, but um, there's, I've seen a couple of pretty interesting interviews. And I mean, what does it mean? Interviews can be like selective and, and whatever, but I think, I don't think it's crazy to say that because of all the various, uh, influences the internet um globalism you know like all, all for better or for worse that sense of of kind of like being a people a nation um is even that in a sense has been corrupted and i think that in a way probably as never before people have no sense of anything being stable and they're longing for it maybe maybe they're not quite longing for it yet but but they're definitely getting that sense of of it's kind of um you know that that the way everything is in critique now the kind of like um, the higher criticism of like everything the deconstructionist aspect of everything it's infected everybody in every aspect of life uh, and so everyone's like, yeah, being whatever, it's not really a thing anymore because it's all corrupted and it's not of any value um, for a lot of reasons, including people have just become incredibly more materialistic and emotionally um, retarded and all these things. But on top of all that, what's also happening, you know, almost simultaneously is that the longing for that is starting to, it's not there yet, but it, it's, I think processes in which that will be um, built out are, are coming. People are gonna start longing for those things again. Cause we're not at the point yet where things are so bad where people are pining for um, kind of in mass pining for the kind of like cohesive glue and order of, the, of, of old. Conservatives are sure, traditionalists are sure. But there's still a large portion of the world's population and, and definitely a majority of the West that isn't really caring or even aware of that. So there has to be something that kicks in that shift of wanting that. And I would submit, you know, this is probably one of the things that we see, you know, one of our favorite topics in regards of the Antichrist, like you know, that is one of, that's, I know one of the key shifts that I, that I'm, you know, kind of always keep my eye out for, because um, not looking out for things to get worse. That's not the key for me. The key is people saying, you know, peace and safety. That's when like, when people in mass are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, this is good. Peace and safety. 
that's when the problem is. But we're so far from that right now. Um, people are still operating business as usual. We're going to have to have some pretty gnarly stuff happen to shift people. There's going to have to be some horror to shift people, to get them to begin to pine again for a earthly kingdom. And this is where Kiliasm comes in. This is why, you know, his kingdom shop no end was added into the creed because of this heresy of Kiliasm in regards of trying to establish the thought that Christ is going to establish a, a, a kind of worldly, earthly kingdom here that had to be put in put into the creed actually. Um, and that spirit, there's neo, there's neo Kiliasts now. And they're not just the amillennialists who think that you know, Christ is going to set up um, a, you know, a, a, an actual earthly quote unquote reign in Jerusalem. You know, these, you know, if I can say the word, you know, the kind of uh, dispensationalist, Zionist, all that stuff. Like it's, it's beyond them. I mean, it's people, it's trans, transhumanism. They, they are neo Kilias. They, they are looking for, they're looking for a god which they think it's them you know and they want to establish like an earthly kingdom it's this is this is the thing but that kingdom is temporal and it, and it will fall in every cycle epoch it does but the lord's kingdom has no end that's why whether it's daxiotis whether it's saint nicholas whether it's saint matrona whichever saint matrona you pick you you begin to commune with them and you can you begin to experience eternity because it's not even like i'm this is something people don't think about like for us as orthodox especially in the modern age and us westerners it's like you if you stop and think you're like oh all the icons they're all wearing like well technically you're not this but for people i'm just going to use a word which is improper so you know don't bunch of people write me about this but it's like for most people you're like why are you know oh they're all wearing togas they're not wearing togas but if you don't know any better that's what you think they're wearing right um but we never stop and, and we never stop and think consciously of the quote-unquote ancient you know uh uh dress code of the icons and you know how i know we don't i can prove it to you I've never had one of my children, not once. My oldest is 20. My youngest is, you know, 14 months. I've never had a kid say to me anything about the clothing of the icon. Think about that. I've never had a kid say to me, my kids, that is. How come they, they dress like that? I've never had that happen. Why? Because my kids are encountering the saint. They're communing with the saint, and they're and in that communing, that encountering, they're they're touching eternity. It, it, it transcends the kind of like locality of fashion and all these these temporal things. If you guys understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah, that's totally. A, that's another hallmark of the kingdom that people. People never think of it, but hopefully I've made it explicit and people start can, can understand and see like what this begins to look like, you know? Hey, Father, I know this is not really to your point, but it did raise a question. If someone who are not a clerg member of the clergy or something were made a saint today, would they still be depicted in that same kind of clothing? Or like, like say Joe Schmo was martyred without a doubt, was Orthodox, was asked to deny Christ and yeah, holy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, like, um, he was a blue, blue jeans and t white t shirt type of guy. Yeah, like Alexander Shforo, like the white rose, right? He he was canonized by the Russian church for, you know, um, defying the Nazis. He's depicted in a white shirt with his, you know, armband. Oh, duh. I've already seen, yeah. You know, yeah. um, Tsar Nicholas. Mean, yeah. Czar Nicholas. I mean, I'm like looking around and see what I got, but like, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you mentioned the other day, Father, and again, this is not really to what you're talking about, but it is something interesting to talk about because I think we're kind of left a little bit in the dark 
I'm not gonna, I'm gonna take that back. What age do we like, because we're talking about like the judge of living and the dead. So then we have to talk about the resurrection of the dead, the general resurrection. And then like, to what state of our body would we be like resurrected to? Is that like the state when you die? Or is that like the state of like uh, a certain time? Like, so if uh, a child, an infant dies, is that- what I've heard, from what I've heard, what I've read, and again, I, I mean, I don't know, but what I've read is what's sticking out in my mind is a consistent understanding of people being experienced as like the 33. Okay. Age, right. And there's people who say, well, that's the year the Lord died. That's the age the Lord died. This is kind of like ideal, kind of like age in many ways. That's the most I can point to, you know? Um, but I mean, that's it's just speculation at that point, you know, definitely from my end, I've, I haven't had a vision of, of the, the eschaton. Um, we'd have to dig in and find the saints that have had it, but they, I, that's what I've read is that that's what, the, that's what people have seen or experienced. But then there's accounts where people have seen the saints, you know, as they were, they remember them older. And there's, there's accounts where I've seen them and they're like, you know, younger, like they're 33, you know? So it's, and I think that's the thing is there's, like everything else it's not static it's not rigid and you know there's a fluidity that's there because yeah we're not catholics come on now <laughs> they're like galactus everybody sees them differently do they yeah that's, that's a Galact- thing that's galactus canon everybody sees galactus that way but that's not his objective form oh yeah Oh, but not everybody sees each individual doesn't see him differently. Everybody sees him as the Galactus thing yes, that we're used to, this but is that's for, not his real form. As the comic book scholar, I have to say, I have to bow out now and say, I don't know. <laughs> but from what I understand, the objective point of view that everybody in the Marvel Universe sees Galactus as, as he is drawn by Jack Kirby. But I, you know, if, if, but that's not his objective form. He's, he's talked, I think he talks about in Secret Wars. He's like, you've seen me this way, but this is not my form. This is how you see me. Mm-hmm. No, okay, this is canon. It's Donny Cates' run on Thor. That's what he's talking about. When Donny Cates is writing Thor, he's talking about like, you see me this way, but this, this is not actually how I am. The, this is just the way your mind is taking in who I am. Mm-hmm. So with the... Yeah, the, yeah. But anyway, okay. so Galactus is tight. But anyway... So yeah, I, I mean, but see, you have interesting things too, where it's like um, the mother of God of Jerusalem, maybe Sabrina, if you want to pull that up, that would be great. Oh, I can um, do that. Um, so the mother of God of Jerusalem, and I think um, there's also uh, Christ, and I don't know if this would be correct, uh, Satori, the nuns of Satori had this, uh, painted this depiction of Christ, um, but St. Paisios, he was, he has, he's been quoted saying like, oh, this is what she looks like, the Panagia. Um, <laughs> and so, and then this icon that the, that his nuns, uh, painted, this is based off of his description of seeing Christ too. Um, here I've got the, uh, I've got the mother of God. Let me, uh, you can tell me which one of these mother of God of Jerusalem I have. I think at least that's what I Googled. You could tell me if any of these is, if I'm on the right track here. Yeah. The gold one with the Risa right there. Yeah, yeah. This one? All the, 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 all the top, way over. Top left? Yeah. Right there. The, use that big one, the top left. Uh, top left. Uh, sorry. Here? Right. I guess like. Top right. Oh, the right the right okay. sorry like that see the, uh, the one that's actually gold the right? one that's oh, actually one? gold yeah the actually gold reza the covering um oh 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 that's actually gold yeah. uh i can't even oh this right one there. yeah okay yeah. this one yeah mm-hmm. okay let me let me pop that into a new open uh, open image in new tab and we'll take a look okay then let me zoom bad boy enhance enhance there we go okay got it yeah how's that yeah so saint Paisius, he's like oh that's what she looked like when i saw her hmm interesting 
Yeah. Well, that's kind of daunting. Yeah. Yeah, that would be daunting. Yeah. Hmm. Could she could she, like, could she appear differently, or is the or or is it that she would always appear the same way? Is that no, how she, she appeared no. in her life? No, she's definitely appeared differently to people. Christ appeared as a child to Saint Christopher, and then like Saint Christopher hoisted him up, and then you know all that stuff. Wasn't there like a uh, story of like Saint Porphyrios? They were like looking to install like a toilet in a cell or something like that, and they picked a spot. He's like, no, not there. That's where the Mother of God stood. Like once she appeared to me, he Whoa. was like, I, I can't have like a toilet there. Wow. wow. No, I've never heard that story, but wow, that's that's incredible. Whoa. So yeah, I mean, um it's it's a mystery. Which disclaimer for however many episodes we've had, disclaimer, it's all a mystery. Which doesn't mean that you can't know it in the sense of experiencing it it just means that you can't pin it down to simply your experience again we're not catholics yeah. we're not trying to make it legalistic it's not legalistic at all yeah which is interesting about not you know the idea that you can't pin it down to your own experience but yet there is this like undeniable quality of like lives of the saints but then also you know as i've talked about talked with orthodox people of their own experiences in their life and as we've talked on this show of like they're not they're still not being contradictions like in all of this like while you know the saint the lives of the saints there may be different things that happen with them and they're qualitatively different types of people the things that happen there's just no contradiction there yeah well you know there's that old there's that saying orthodoxy is paradoxy right and that's primarily because of the absolute personal nature of it you know and i think i mean i think the thing is when you like for me okay so my life has been people you know i mean for some people their life is the machine you know mm. they they they've dedicated themselves to the machine, you know, mm -hmm. for better or for worse. But for me, my life has been people. Um, and so the one thing that I, you know, the one thing that I know and I don't know at the same time is people, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the thing I know about people is that people will surprise you. The thing that I know about people is that people are way more dynamic than, than I think they, than they recognize, you know? And I could say the same, they're way more static in certain ways than they, than they want to acknowledge. Yeah. Yeah. But, but people are way more dynamic than, than I think people, you know, actually realize. And, and, and that says something um, to me about the image of God, or if you will, the experience of the kingdom or the potential of the, ex the potential of the experience of the kingdom within every person, because it's, um, it's, in it's incredibly personal. It's one of the reasons why, I mean, just for me, it's um, every person, every single one of my spiritual children, every single one of my biological children. I mean, it's just like, there is this, you, this, this, there's this aspect that is so unique. It's, it's, it's not repeatable. It's not, um, it, it's, it can only be found in that person, right? There, there's, there is a uniqueness to each person insofar as also the fact that their relation to the world, to reality, which is God is, is unique, right? Um, which when you understand that, then the seriousness and the gravitas in which we approach our life as Orthodox Christians begins to make so much more sense. The reason why we're pro-life begins to make so much more sense. It isn't just out of a rote morality of like killing is bad, but it's like the profundity of, of each individual soul and their experience of God, that just, it's mind blowing, right? of all, and, and forgive me for going there, but if when you begin to think of, 
Um, of all, this is, forgive me how hard this is gonna be for people, but I need to go there. Of all the quote unquote, you know, abortions that have happened, each one of them is an irreplaceable communion. If you, if you look at it in that sense, right? It's an irreplaceable communion. It's, it's imagine what the world would have been like with a quarter of those souls. You know what I'm saying? And it's just important to take it out of these moralistic, legalistic kind of confines and begin to, to experience it, you know, in, in a greater context of like of, of ontology or being of like, what is the ramifications of this? You know, what are the ramifications of, what are the ramifications of the sanctity of life? What are the ramifications of the fact that each human soul has a uniquely, you know, a, a unique corner of the kingdom of God, potentially, if, if that makes sense, what I'm saying, you know what I mean? It's, and the fact that God would share his life with the, with, with a human soul like that, you know, it's, I, I don't know. It's the kingdom. This is a, this week I had a student in one of my classes who uh, after class just reached out to me and I guess was asking some things, I guess has kind of a Christian background, but it's done some like plant medicine type of cult type of stuff and just had some like questions and was, oh, you're Orthodox, ask, ask me these questions. And towards the end, I just was like, now we're beginning to punch, smart guy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but like, I was like, now we're beginning to punch above uh, my weight. You probably need to reach out. If you really want to know these questions, you really, the answers to these, you should reach out, find a Orthodox parish near you and reach out to the priest who's there and have a conversation. But one of the things that he that he did mention or like bring up, and it was something that I had also said, and we talked about it in an early, earlier episode here, um, was talking about the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And he was like, he said it's kind of the same thing that I said to you, right? Where it was like, uh, okay, Father, okay, I get. Son and Lord, like I get. Person of the Holy Spirit, like this is a little bit of a harder concept. But <laughs> you, you saying, like in speaking about this communion and in speaking about this uniqueness of the individuals and particularly in the context of the lives of the saints, something clicked off to me because it was like, you know, the whole the Holy Spirit is the uh, in all the differences between them, right? But if so, if we read the lives of the saints, like the Holy Spirit is the constant between all of them. Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, is it is it in that like there's this great diversity and we see the kingdom, but it's but that the Holy Spirit is like the personage or the personality of the Holy Spirit is the thread that underlines through all of it. Like, so are we, are we experiencing the person of the Holy Spirit when we commune with the, with, with the saints? Like, are, are we experiencing, is, is that thing which is common in that communion, is that the Holy Spirit? Mm, yes and no. Yes, no. Okay. Because, <laughs> because it is in the sense that, you know, let's, let's, yes, in the sense that, okay, the Holy Spirit is God right and the common thread is god okay um but you know you you have saints like the obvious one like saint seraphim of Sarov, right who have this unique um uh charism of being able to articulate that aspect of the person the, the kind of hypostasis of, of the holy spirit in a way that is um you know it, it's just it, it's different it's it's un, it's unique he's able to speak on the holy spirit in a way that um you know uh saint Silwan didn't speak in the same way of the holy spirit you know um and i and i think i think so so in that sense like no but you know, in the sense, obviously, yes, because he's because the Holy Spirit is God, and the traditions of the church are the experience of the Holy Spirit, right? That's that's right. So, so yes, that's that's the common thread. Um, but but I think more to the point of kind of addressing, not answering, but addressing what this what you and this gentleman were talking about. Um, 
and I don't know, my whole world is a blur. So I apologize if we talked about this last time or before, but there's these things where it's like, you know, the conviction of sin is uniquely like that's one of the, you know, experience of the Holy Spirit, right? The pointing to Christ, right? That's, so these are the things we talked about. Um, and I think that's important because, you know, not everybody who is a quote unquote Orthodox Christian has this experience of being pointed to this kind of like fiery devotion to Jesus, right? Um, and I, what I mean is not the experience of Jesus directly, but devotion to him, right? That's characteristic of the, the, the person of the Holy Spirit and his work. Are you following what I'm saying, right? Yes. Um, so, so I think, I mean, there, there are these things that I'm just speaking from it, not just from what I've seen patristically in the lines and, you know, lines of the saints with my own personal experience. Right. So, so there is a, there is a distinction there. And I think that I, th I think that the experience of the Holy spirit is far more ubiquitous than people realize and much of what they may ascribe to quote unquote Jesus might is actually probably is I, I know this just in, in regards of having you know my own spiritual children there's there's lots of times where I'm like well that's an ex that's you know if we could pin it down right because you know God could come down smack me and be like you're wrong dummy but if we could pin it down and be like that's I would say that's an experience of the Holy Spirit what you're what you're de describing to me you know what I mean and they may not, they may not recognize it as such, you know? And I mean, the same is said, where it's just like, there's, there's been things where I'm like, well, what you're experiencing right there, daughter, that's actually your guardian angel. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, but I'm, but it's also don't want to get hard and fast and be like, pin it down. Right. But every time you feel this way, that's your guardian angel. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm not way. trying to say that, you know, yeah. I'm not trying to say that, but you know. And is the distinction like is the distinct is the distinction our like is it our our limitation because if we were less limited would we need would we even be able to make the distinction could we make the distinction between uh christ and the holy spirit or a guardian angel if we is it our limitation yeah it's our limitation but it, it's also to understanding what that means though it's not like you get to this state objectively where now you're a master and then like God, like God is beholden to you yeah. and you're understanding, you know what I mean? It's like, well, you got me figured out. I can't right, do right. anything now. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, this, this is, this is one of the hard things about um, our praxis too. It's like, I could talk, to, we could spin, we, we could stop now. We could say, we're not going to do the creed anymore. And as long as people want to listen, we're just going to talk about praxis and prayer. We could do that. There's, I mean, it's an it's an inexhaustible area of, of uh, topic of discussion, right? Um, but within all that, it wouldn't matter because I'd say like we could talk for days about vigil and about asceticism and all these different things, right? But at the end of the day, God's going to come to you when He wants to, and the and the saints are clear on that. And if you have any experience in prayer, you know that. It doesn't matter how hard you're praying, how tight, how good, how whatever, it doesn't matter. God's going to visit you when he wants to. And if you don't accept that and understand that, then like we got bigger problems. You know what I mean? Because the experience of like what we are doing is trying to make ourselves available to grace. That's why, you know, you get into the parable of, of the, this is, this is kingdom stuff, right? You get into the parable of the virgins, right? And the, the, the wise virgins who are waiting, right? That don't just understand that eschatologically. Like people read that and they're like, oh, I don't want to, you know, be smoking crack in Vegas this weekend because what if the Lord comes back? You know what I mean? Like, don't just understand it in that sense of like, Jesus is going to come back right when you decided to go on a bender and like the world ends like yes that could happen and yes you could die in the midst of that bender and like so you don't want to do that but i would even say 
understand that in regards of, you know, being watchful and attentive with your inner life in general, like in prayer. Because everyone knows what I'm about to talk about. If you're Orthodox or if you have experience of prayer, you know what I'm saying when you're just kind of banging it out. When you're yeah. just when you're just banging your prayer rule out. You Checking know what I mean? Watch while you're praying. We're all we are all guilty of it. All of us, right? So this is the this, you know, let us be like the five wise virgins. Let us be watchful. Let us have the oil, right? Oil for the lamp. Let us have the spirit, speaking of which, right? That's what the oil and the lamp is. It's the spirit. We need to have the spirit in order to be really awake and, and watching for the bridegroom, which is Christ, right? Christ is the bridegroom. So this is this is all part of what that means to be in the kingdom because we experience the kingdom now. This is Saint Simon the New Theologian, right? You need to, if you're not experiencing the kingdom now, something's wrong, right? If you're just experiencing the letter of the law, if you're just experiencing the law, you're dying, you know, and I can, I can not exhaustively, I can, I can go like, oh, this person is just in the letter of the law. They're not in the kingdom because they're bitter, because they're resentful, because, you know, they're, you know, we all get irritable, but typically they're an irritable person just in regards of like their religious life, kind of like on the whole, that's a sign that you're into the law and you're dying because you don't have your, you, you don't have any nutrients, right? A person Conversely, a person who is, you know, maybe not the most buttoned up, maybe not the most morally, quote unquote, like, you know, sound example, but they have that, you know, je ne sais quoi, they have that, uh, that joy, they have that, they got something about them, you know what I mean? They got the oil, man, you know what I mean? They got the love, they got, they, they, that's, that's the thing. And so God's like, yeah, yeah, maybe you're drinking a little bit too much. And I'm not, I'm not happy about it, but when you're with me, you're really with me. That means so much more to the Lord than the person who's perfect, reads all the books, has all the right affect, you know what I mean? Has all, has the good look, the good, the good ortho look, but he's just like, he's got no love, man. You know what I mean? I'm just, that's, that's the reality. Boy, that bugs me. I'm not saying that I'm not that guy sometimes, but there's a there's just been a couple of times where I've seen someone, and it's okay. God love them, pray for them, and you know maybe they've repented since then because I I don't experience them anymore. But um, there's just some uh, you know, just some guys that are just like they just do their crosses so perfectly and they bow like they're holding up the like veneration line because they're just like kissing each icon so like perfectly and making sure that they just bow so elegantly and so beautifully and there's nothing wrong with that i don't want to you know i'm not i'm not a priest don't listen to anything i have to say i don't mean to scandalize anyone but like there's just this like point of just being like who are you doing this for well here's like, here's the problem right here's the problem because i actually i can appreciate that but the problem is is if then you talk to them during coffee hour and they're absolutely repugnant and disdainful of everybody and everything that aren't doing what they're doing that's part two that's then part that's the problem right it's like <laughs> yeah you know? because then you go hang out with them and they're just like oh that person deserves a good smack on the mouse and i'm like where's that coming from that's kind of coming from like a weird place you just took communion there friendo and not that that's wrong to talk about smacking people right after you took communion but that coupled with your like 30 second Matanya is like, it's just all like hitting off, hitting off kilter mm -hmm. for me. So mm -hmm. anyway, well, fellas, unless Cyprian, you got something to say. I don't. All right. It's about that time. So, <clears throat> um, I have one of two questions. And I'm going to do one. the orthodox one. Okay. What was a mistake that you made your first Lent? This is my first Lent. What was a mistake you made, Cyprian? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, like, what is something, and maybe not even your first Lent, but Cyprian and I, it ended up, it ended up like we ended up talking about something different, but the conversation we're going to have, and maybe we'll do have it 
at another time when father's not available is what were some of your rookie mistakes? Some of those mistakes that you made? Because I was going to ask about what's your favorite soundtrack to a movie, but I was like, let's keep it on theme of orthodoxy. So I was like, well, it is Lent. It is Lent. So let's kind of try and keep it keep it within the bumpers a little bit i'm sure i've made an incredible number of mistakes <laughs> so sure. far with yeah. this one and i and i probably won't know that they were mistakes <laughs> probably till next lent or the lent after but i'm sure that i've made i'm sure that i've made a, I mean, a mine's huge silly. number of them mine's silly. I, I just i ate nothing but bread i i didn't know how to fast i had no idea so i gave up meat and i gave up cheese zealously that was probably i don't know maybe with reflection i'll come back around that that was not necessarily from god but i just got this zealous nature about that i was buying just cheap bread from a <laughs> iv and it was just like near where i was working at the time and i would just go eat this whole loaf of french bread for lunch and dinner you must have felt terrible oh, i've not done that i've not done that that's what i'm saying this was awful yeah. it was awful it's been constipated well, that's the least of my oh, <laughs> only constipation was my issue. That was not I was like withering away and I was like, I'm becoming an aesthetic. And I was oh, just like, wow. yeah, yeah. Mm. So naturally, when you fall into that kind of deception, which I did, when you fall into that kind of deception, it is then very hard for you to go back to that thing later on. Mm -hmm. So to this day, I still am, I try to be very careful about how I fast. And I honestly sometimes will eat just, a, I'm not saying anybody else should do this, but sometimes every day I just eat a little bit of meat, a little bit of cheese, just like a little bite, just like a little morsel. And then I'm like, okay, I didn't fast today. I ate meat and I ate cheese, but it's really just this idea of being like, you can't, you can't look back on this day and be like, Hey buddy, you kept the fast today. It's like, I had half a chicken nugget. So I had meat. And then I had half a slice of cheese. So I had cheese. What are you going to do? I didn't keep the fast today. And then it's like, cool. So, and we've talked about that with father before. So it's not like I'm just like going out and doing that on my own. So that's my mistake. Uh, uh, I think my, I think the, I think probably the biggest mistake for me, which was, one I kind of held consistently um, was having a, a kind of in the same vein that, that you're talking about, but was having um, uh, the wrong expectation. So um, once I figured this out, it, it changed Lent forever for me. Um, and so that space in which you begin to fail, then you're starting to get, get Lent. Cause that's like, for me, that's what all, that's what consistently is life-giving is, and it's this balance, right? It's, it's trying to find the spirit of the fast and not fasting for the sake of not eating something, not fasting for the sake of trying to uphold my discipline, but for the sake of trying to, um, see myself honestly and see myself honestly i'll be able to hopefully see god uh, more than i was last year more than i was before the fast if, does any of that make sense you know what i mean totally it's like totally. absolutely you know yeah. like it, you know for 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 those who listen who i'm your confessor you know a lot of you have said this this land it's like you've been to me you've been like oh blah 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 and i've been like yeah great you know like oh i failed this and i'm like oh perfect great that's good because now now you get it you know what i mean like that that space of not being able to you know compete like you thought you could that that place of humility that's the whole point not the not the faux humility but that real humility of like i really wanted to and i failed perfect now you've begun mm. you really wanted to and you failed honestly and authentically now you've actually begun because i just want to say this because i want to i know we're at the end but um we can go as long as we want you know the thing 
I've said this again to people before, you know, this will, for some of you, this may sound familiar, but uh, people need to be reminded of why they, why they need the savior. Does that make sense? What I'm saying? Like, yeah, like, totally. like we're, we aren't like truly like, this isn't some kind of like cool thing to say. It's the truth. We can't save ourselves. We, we can't, we absolutely can't. And that's why so many people, I fear for them, uh, if they don't start turning the corner on things, you know, none of my kids per se, but like, you know, <laughs> I see people I'm just like, like, man, like, you know, because those people exist out there where they, they're deluded and they think that they are like some sort of crusader. You're not a crusader, man. Um, you, you, you're not a crusader. Like, like you're you're not God's gift to the church or to moral like nothing like we are begging God to have mercy on us and we need him like Christ doesn't need your offering he doesn't need your rigid discipline he doesn't need your moral character he doesn't need your haircut he doesn't he doesn't need like anything from you you need him and and for a lot of people, um, you know, they could say they can get to this place where like, I don't need Jesus. I'm Orthodox. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just the same thing with like Protestants. Are like, I don't need God. I got the Bible. It's yeah. like, man, you don't, you, you don't get it, man. Like the the term, the, I'm gonna use this term uh, that twelve steppers know, like white knuckling it, like. Mm-hmm. So many people are white knuckling their quote unquote religion. They don't even realize it. You know what I mean? It's like, and this is, I'm not talking about just, you know, quote unquote, you know, to use this term cheap grace, where like, it doesn't matter. God's got it. It's like, no, there's a balance here, right? There's a balance. It's like, it's synergy. You have to try, but just know you're going to fail. But like, that sounds fatalistic. Well, it's not, but it is paradoxical right? You have to try, although you will fail. I mean, isn't this so much of what we get in that, in those greatest of hero stories? Absolutely. Right. If it's It's, a real hero story, you know what I mean? Like, you know, you're going to fail, you know, there's no hope, but you know what? I have to try. Yeah. Yes. That, that to me, that's the ethos of an Orthodox Christian. I know I'm going to fail. Listen, I'm going to end on this, the kingdom. Here, let's get, to me, this is super meta, right? Tsar Lazar, great, great Tsar Lazar, the, Serb- the Serbian king and, and holy saint, named my young and sung after him, right? Knows that he's, I mean, <laughs> insurmountable odds, right? But still goes out there and does it and gets slaughtered, boom right? That, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it's for the kingdom, not the earthly kingdom, because the angel comes to Tsar Lazar and says, Lazar, what do you pick? This is before the battle of Kosovo. What do you pick? The earthly kingdom or the heavenly kingdom? Tsar Lazar picks wise. He chooses the, the heavenly kingdom. Goes out that morning. There are several thousand soldiers are all communed and they go into the battle against the Turks. They're all slaughtered to the man, right? Tsar Lazar is like, what happened? I chose the heavenly kingdom. Angel Lord tells him, absolutely. So therefore you lose the earthly kingdom, right? And it doesn't matter because what you gain is everything and you lose nothing, right? That's our ethos. And every Lent, from my perspective, if you enter into Lent with that ethos, then you then you are a victor. You're a con- you're you're more than a conqueror, right? Because you're entering into the you're entering into the right arena, the proper tournament where the real combat happens, right? So, oh man, I think it'd been cool if the angel, if the Sar Lazar would have been like, <clears throat> oh, I thought I chose the heavenly kingdom, and the angel's like, see you in a bit. <laughs> like, all right, cool. Yeah. But 
By the way, I don't think everybody should be eating chicken nuggets and cheese every day. That's not what I was trying to say. I was genuinely trying to, I'm trying to come from a place of humility here. I'm trying to, like, I did in no way kept the fast. In no way tried that. So, so we've officially got through the first section of the creed. Um, yes. Like this is, this is. It's kingdom shall be alive. And then the, because that's where the creed. Next, is, the Holy Spirit is next where that's where the creed originally ended right father and then they had to go in later and as was a was, a, was a, later okay a all right so i think god willing um if we record next week and i'm still leaving that up to debate because we'll see or up to chance because or up to god we'll see what happens um i think we'll do a questions and answer so okay. if you guys are curious although he, you know i i don't know if this is even meant for the air or whatever i i am open to maybe doing a second one this week because i don't want to record ooh. during during holy week uh, that's a good idea okay. i'm up so, to that so maybe thursday night we can give people okay. a, a, a double whammy or something yeah do a q a yeah. or something that's a good idea. maybe or we can make it like at least a, posthumously or something like that i don't know but yeah 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 because yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll all probably die <laughs> uh, but uh <laughs> yeah i'm open for that um and so if you guys want have any burning questions i think we probably already have enough to fill but if you guys want to throw because i i saw a couple i've been trying to get more interact more people in the comments so i've been reading through more um and uh i saw a couple in there but cyprian if you want to gather up a couple okay or i will or whatever it doesn't matter yeah there's off air stuff either way um and then it's been a while, and I wanted to plug the playlist again on Spotify, the Royal Pass uh, playlist. I listen to it every once in a while. I still link in the it. description. If you're watching on YouTube or Spotify, link in the description. There you go. Um, and then yeah, we the- didn't talk. We didn't talk about COVID today, so we won't get another uh, <laughs> COVID removal on uh, Spotify. So did we get removed? Like, did they remove? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Episode? Instead of they removed, they removed the episode, and in the place of the episode, they put a COVID warning. Hot day. So, thanks, Spotify. Badge of honor. Someone um, ratted on us. Yeah, someone ratted on us. <laughs> because, yeah, we're so far below the radar. Like so far, listening to us on Spotify. Um, so far. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. okay. And then the other thing I wanted to say was last. You dirty rat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last video we had talked a lot about the toll houses, and we said that there's gonna be a link. To Father Cosmos's talk. Oh, I will on, put it in. Yes, no, sure. Okay, but it's also there. Somebody asked about it in the comments, and I replied to him and put the link there. Okay. So, and last week in the comments, so we'll put the link up again. But if you guys, also, you could just type in Orthodox Talks. Yep. Forgive, forgive me, guys. That was I knew I was like, oh, there's supposed to be something else on here, and then no worries, it. no I worries. It. So, uh, and then check out the. Ta-da. <laughs> um now you know it's time to go i'm singing i'm singing like it man i want to do a karaoke episode or something um so uh oh dang that should probably go on the playlist too all right well i gotta go hunt down the lion king soundtrack but anyway um you guys uh playlist i feel like that was everything okay thank That's you for everything. having a good night thank you <laughs> bye-bye <laughs> bye guys <laughs>